Well, everyone excited for Christmas? Is it going to be just another day? Or do we let the joy of Jesus make it that day? Make it a special day? Now, why do I ask that question? Because not every Christmas is exactly what you want or expect. But every Christmas can remind you of the blessings that you already have. Not every Christmas is a Norman Rockwell painting. It's a little bit different for you this year. And in it's been that way for a lot of you. That the first Christmas without your significant other is difficult. But I want to focus on what we have rather than what we don't have. Not personally because what blessings the world has received because of Jesus. In other words, we have a lot of blessings because we're believers. But how has the world been blessed because Jesus was born? How many have seen It's a Wonderful Life? So we're going to take off on that a little bit today. What if Jesus had never been born? Now the Christmas story has been around for about 2,000 years and nothing new has been added to the book or the story since then. And every Christmas, I'm sure Pastor Tim has the same thing, how do you talk about something different every Christmas, every year, for 30 years for us, or more? You kind of, it's the same story. How are you going to change it up? How are you going to make it different? Well, times have changed since that first Christmas, but the story hasn't. And if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you've probably heard the same sermon over and over again, or variations of the same sermon. In fact, I've done about 30 of them, and I'm sure Pastor Tim has done more than that. So it's getting hard to do something new about Christmas. In fact, in Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. So what I'm gonna share today is really nothing new but it's always good to be reminded of what God has done in this world. So we're gonna read from Matthew's account. Matthew 1 verse 18 says, now this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiance being a just man, decided to break the engagement quietly so as not to disgrace her publicly. As he considered this, he fell asleep and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, don't be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to Mary. For the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son in your to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this happened to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded. He brought Mary home to be his wife, but she remained a virgin until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Now, that's a, that's a one-time get-out-of-jail-free card. This conceived by the Holy Spirit, not going to fly today. So there's no more immaculate conceptions today as much as people would like to think that. It's not gonna happen. But the birth of Jesus is the single biggest event in human history. Christ's birth has not really been in dispute, even by non-believers. Everyone believes that, I would say 99% of the people believe that Jesus was born and that Jesus existed. It's what they consider him is what differentiates us. Now, Obviously, we don't know when he was born. Some think September, but it doesn't really matter. We're celebrating his birth today. Many have attributed the significance to the coming of the Messiah as we do, but there's an undeniable truth that Jesus would, was born. So, how would the world be today if Jesus were not born? If nothing happened 2,000 so years ago, and if his, death, if his birth was no big deal, or he was just another baby, a good man or a prophet, how would the world be different today? Well, I mean, 
did Jesus really make that big of a difference? Outside of Christianity, has Jesus made a difference? Now, if you all know John Lennon's song, Imagine, I think a lot of people think that's a great song. I think that's a horrible song. <laughs> a lot of people think that it would end a lot of problems if Christ were not born, right? If there's no Christianity, there would be no problems in the world. How many have been told that? If it wasn't for Jesus, man, the world would just be coming along smoothly. There'd be no, no conflict. Well, I think if we didn't have Christians, there'd be no inquisitions if you've done history. No Christians fed the lions. No manger scenes at courthouses to protest. No pro-lifers at rallies. No people trying to shut down strip bars. If, if Christianity didn't exist, all these problems would go away. Well, untrue. What would it be like if he had never been born? And actually, as I was preparing this, I found that there's a book called What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? So I actually got a lot of information from this book and a couple of others. So let's walk backwards through time to see what would be different. Well, for example, if we walk starting now, we went backwards in time, none of us would be here, right? None of us would be in this building. This building wouldn't exist. Your lives would be totally different than they are now. You'd have different priorities, different things in your life that you focus on. None of it would be what it is today. People who have been saved or helped by this church would not have been helped or saved. People who have had their lives changed here would not have been saved, would not have been helped, would not have been changed. Many of us would have never met each other and formed friendships that we have today. People who've been married here obviously wouldn't have been married here. Because why would you have marriage? Because marriage, if you look in the Bible, was instituted by God, not man. Marriage is a God thing. The world has picked up on that. So there would be no marriages. And it's funny, people who don't go to church still want to get married in a church. Why would there need be a need to get married? There wouldn't be because that was a God thing. God instituted that back in Genesis. We make marriage vows before who? Before the Lord. Well, no Lord, no vows. We wouldn't, take, we wouldn't be having vows. Without marriage, there would be no commitment. Parents can come and go as they please. Forget the wife and kids. <laughs> but we're seeing that today, right? A lot of that going on today. If you weren't saved here, you would have not been saved anywhere because there wouldn't be churches anywhere. That's the end of that. <laughs> there would be not any salvation. There would be no Jesus to save you. Funerals would mean nothing because after you die, what happens? There'd be no hope. Be no hope. Why would any of us desire to be good people? We wouldn't. There's a thing called common grace. How many have heard of common grace? Common grace is when you look at people who aren't Christians and they still behave nice, they're nice people, but they're not believers, that's because they have common grace. They have the ability to be nice, but not saved. So that wouldn't even exist. If you want to know what it'd be like without Christ, look at Revelation 6 through 13. That's what it's going to be like without Jesus. So we go a little bit further back in time, there would be no Salvation Army. There would be no Christmas celebrations, no soup kitchens, no city missions, no Red Cross, or no YMCAs. But that's okay, because it wouldn't be a Pennsylvania either. Pennsylvania was named for a Quaker preacher named William Penn. If he were not in full-time service for the Lord, he would not have been given this land to settle and then would not have been able to have it named Pennsylvania. A quote attributed to Penn says that God has given this to me, God, the God that has given it to me, I will believe, bless it and make it a seed of a nation. So Pennsylvania wouldn't exist as it is now without Jesus. And even if PA were a state, it wouldn't be PA. We would not have the laws that we have today because all the laws in the books are basically somebody's version of morality. Laboring for Christ, Penn's plan for government for this new territory was to, quote, this is William Penn, make and establish new, such laws as best preserve true Christian liberty and civil liberty in opposition to all unchristian 
practices. That was Penn's desire, William Penn's desire for this state. And even before that, America's laws were founded on Christian principles as much as people don't like to believe that. 1892, the Supreme Court, in an opinion, clearly stated that this is a, quote, Christian nation. Now, no one outside of the church believes that today, but that's the way it started out. And if there were no Christ, there would be no nation because it was founded for the promulgation of the gospel. The Mayflower Compact, how many heard that in your history class? Now, if you're in school today, you might not see that. But back 100 years ago, when we were in school, they had a Mayflower Compact. And it was known as the, quote, birth certificate of America, written by the first settlers of Plymouth. And it stated that they originally set out, this is their quote from the, from the compact, for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That's why they came. Now, if we go further back, Columbus, whose name is vilified today, again, because he's a believer, discovered America because as his own diaries reveal, he set out with a mission to preach the gospel to whatever country he came to. And Columbus was one of the few that was not a flat earther. Are there flat earthers today? Flat earthers today? Okay. But he wasn't a flat earther because he believed that the Bible was a sphere because the Bible says the earth is a sphere. In Isaiah 40 it says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He, God, sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. God, or Columbus knew the earth was not flat. That's why he settled out, because he believed the Bible was true. Now, what about those who are in academia and the media that tell us that Christians aren't the experts? You go to a, you have any kind of talk show, you have an expert on one side and an expert on the other side, and they usually bring in a Christian who's not really well versed in being a debater or a, a good orator, and so they, they conflict. Well, way back when, the experts said the world was flat. The experts told us that the sun revolved around the earth. What do experts tell us today? Time always reveals God's truth. Yesterday's medical books are today's joke books. How many have heard of bloodletting? All the practices they had 100 years ago or 200 years ago that they thought was medical science has been proven to be ridiculous today. And all the experts of the past who thought the earth was flat was proven wrong. They thought earth or the sun revolved around the earth. They were proved it wrong. Experts are only expert if it agrees with what the Bible says about the truth. What about education? Most of the education we see today in public schools and colleges and universities are decidedly non-Christian. But the beginnings of education were founded on a Christian basis. In 1642, 1647, the Puritans were the ones who passed laws requiring and establishing public education. While different than what we have today, it mandated that towns hire and pay teachers for their children. That's the beginning of the public education. In fact, the name of the law that required this was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. Meaning that Satan would be able to delude those who could not read and read specifically the Bible. So they educated young people to be able to read so they were able to understand what the Bible says and not be tricked by what the enemy says. In 1787, the Northwest Ordinance was passed. And this, quoted, this stated, quote, religion and morality and knowledge being necessary to good government. That's how it starts out and it goes on. Harvard and Yale, William and Mary, Brown, Princeton, New York University, Northwestern were all started by churches. Dartmouth was founded by missionaries to train missionaries. William and Mary was created, quote, so that the Christian faith might be propagated. 
Columbia University, quote, the chief thing that is aimed at this college is to teach and engage children to know God in Jesus Christ. Harvard, quote, the great end of all education is to know the Lord Jesus Christ who is eternal life. All these top tier schools, which are now decidedly anti-Christian, were started by Christians. If no Jesus, then no colleges like this. So let's assume that all of this are, is here without the aid of the Lord. How has he helped us individually? I mean, how has he helped society as a whole? What would be different in, if Jesus in society had never been born? Well, look at children. Matthew 19, 13. It says, some children were brought to Jesus so he could lay hands on them and pray for them. The disciples told them not to bother him. But Jesus says, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And he put his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. Prior to Jesus, children were held in low esteem, almost like property. They were strictly thought of as something that they could do with what they wanted to. A man could do what he wanted to his children because they were treated as property, almost as animals. Jesus gave the children worth and meaning and not only to society, but he gave them meaning to God. At that point, up to that point, children had no meaning at all, only as to what they can contribute. In ancient civilizations and even today, in some areas, well obviously today, abortion practiced. And infanticide is practiced. In the Old Testament, when God described, quote, the detestable practices of Molech, I haven't even read that phrase before. God judged an entire nation because of that practice. And that practice was offering children on a hot coal altar to this God Molech. That was their sacrifice. And God hated it so much, he wiped out the entire country. Scare you a little bit? Leviticus 20 verse 2 says, If any among them devote their children as burnt offerings to Molech, they must be stoned to death by the people of the community. Jesus gave children value simply because they existed, not because of what they can contributed. They were no longer considered possessions or property. If you look at the Canaanites, they were also ch uh, child sacrificers. The prophet of Baal and Ashtoreth were the official murderers of children, and that's why God ordered their destruction. With the introduction of the church and the influences of Christians, these practices all but ceased in ancient countries. The church called for these unwanted babies to be brought to them and would care for them because of what Jesus says. That was the birth of orphanages. They did it because Jesus called them to bless the children. Jesus brought value to their lives. Now, you think that the stuff doesn't go on today, but obviously we know we're wrong. Infanticide goes on today. How many know, how many know that? I read this article years ago that a couple had a handicapped child that needed a lot of surgery to live. The parents refused the treatment to let the child die. Hundreds of people called up to adopt the child. Hey, we'll take it, we'll, we'll do it. But a judge refused all of their requests and allowed the baby to die. Kind of wait for the fire of God to come down, right? The God of expediency. That's what they have today. The judge decides who lives and dies. The pro-life movement is almost all Christian based. And it's definitely around the idea that, God, that Christ says to defend all life. Look at all the Proverbs that talk about, you know, Psalm 139, numerous other songs that talk about life begins at a conception, the Bible clearly states that. And science has proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt, but the world still ignores that. Even when the gospel, even in areas where the gospel has not penetrated, infanticide is still practiced. But once the gospel gets here, it stops. Now, what about women? Now, if you listen to most women's groups, you think Christianity is the worst thing to happen to women since men. 
The feminists feel that Christianity is the downfall of women, but the opposite is just the truth. In ancient cultures and even some today, women are little more than what infants were, property of their husbands and their fathers. Look at modern day uh, Middle East. We see it today in different countries, surgery on girls, honor killings, because they are thought of as property, not human beings. In the late 1800s, two women missionaries went to China to spread the gospel, but found that female infanticide was commonplace. And these ladies would comb the countryside in search of these babies that were abandoned and take care of them. And even today, China, I think, still has a one child limit, forced abortion after one child. Unless the child's a boy, then it's okay. Christianity came to India. Widows used to be burned alive on their husband's graves until Christianity came there. All throughout America's history, there can be little doubt about our Christian heritage, although a lot try to deny it. Now, while it may be gone today, the influence of Christians in, in the country, the blessings of God on our country can't be denied. I mean, you look at the things that we have that other countries would love to have. And we have it, and we still have it today, I believe because of the Christian influence in the world. The desire to spread the gospel, the desire to send out missionaries, the desire to to do what's the right thing. Look at any other country on earth. What other country has been blessed like ours? You look at Muslim countries or Hindu countries, apostate Christian countries, atheistic countries, none of them have experienced the blessings, the material blessings that we have. Look at the Middle East, they're they're always in war. Hindus have extreme poverty and disease. Apostate countries have social unrest and no moral restraint. Atheistic countries, Soviet Union, Stalin, You know, Hitler, we think, is a bad guy. Hitler was a piker compared to these guys. Stalin killed 60 million of his people. China, Mao's government, killed 42 and a half million of his own people. I was reading the other day, why, and I'm not saying Hitler wasn't bad because he was, but why do we focus on Hitler? He only killed, quote, only 6 million compared to the other ones. The difference is they killed their own people. Stalin killed his own people. Mao killed his own people. Hitler didn't kill his own people. That's why it's, it's in the news like it is. That's why it's so focused on. But everyone forgets the, the horrible, horrible conditions of any communist country. Look at Cuba. Look at Venezuela. Every time it's tried, it fails. And the only way they can enforce it is by death, by force. But when you have Christianity come in, And it changes the leadership, it changes the laws to make it Christ-like. These things don't happen. And that's what happens when you take God out of the picture. What about Jesus' impact on science? Now a lot of people think that science and Jesus don't mix. But some of our most famous scientists were Christians. Louis Pasteur, bacteriology. He was a Christian. Isaac Newton, Discovered the law of gravity and calculus, was a Christian. Blaise Pascal, another math guy, and computer language, actually, was a Christian. Charles Babbage, another computer science guy, was a Christian. Joseph Lister, which is antiseptic surgery, he was a Christian. Now, from science, we can go to medicine and healing. The Bible says, quote, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them. The example of Jesus healing people was the backdrop for the modern hospital movement. Early hospitals were actually hospices formed to care for people like Jesus did. And they were all started by churches. Look at the names of hospitals today. Now I'm looking at some Pittsburgh hospitals and around here. St. Francis, St. Margaret's, Presbyterian. Mercy Hospital, Baptist Hospital, Holy Cross Hospital, retirement homes, Presbyterian Senior Care, Methodist Home, Baptist Home. 
Now, the names have changed over the years, but they were started at one time by Christians and by a church. Charles Rosenberg, a professor of history, sociology, and science at the University of Penn, wrote a book called The Care of Strangers, The Rise of the American Hospital System. And he wrote that early hospitals were framed and motivated by the responsibilities of Christian stewardship. We're responsible to help other people. Florence Nightingale, founder of modern nursing, was a devout woman taught by a German Lutheran pastor. Henry Dunmant, a Swiss banker and a Christian, started the YMCAs. He later founded the Red Cross. And what's the international symbol for the Red Cross? A cross. Coincidence? Now we see today non-Christian countries replacing the cross symbol with one of their own because they don't like the current Christian symbol that's being used. And to this day, U.S. sends out many Christian medical missionaries. And Christians are the ones who help the hungry children in third world countries. We close with this. Now see, we started at 10 o'clock today, so I still have till noon, right? John 21, 25 says, and if I suppose that if all the other things Jesus did were written down, the whole world cannot contain the books. This, this short sermon is in comparison to the whole of what Jesus has accomplished is minuscule. There are so many other areas that we could talk about. Christianity's contribution to civil liberties. You look at the Civil Rights Act. That was Christians, not fake Christians, but true Christians that were trying to get Civil Rights Act enacted. The fake Christians were trying to stop it. So don't get that confused. Christianity's effect on economics. Christianity's effect on the family. Despite what we see on TV and the movies, the Christian ideal for the family is still what most Americans want. They want one man, one woman, and kids. That's what most families want. And most families believe that adultery and divorce are wrong. It, it happens, but they still believe it's wrong. So people already want what God has planned. Christianity's role on arts and music. Most of what we hear today about arts and music is bad, but it's not always been that way. God created music. How many are thankful that God created music? Many great composers were believers. Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, and Mendelssohn were all Christians. And these guys, in turn, influenced the next generation of Haydn, Mozart, uh, Chopin, Wagner, Brahms, and others. Remember how one life touches another and touches another and goes on? Everyone's life here has been touched by somebody else. And the, probably the most important thing for us to realize today is how would your life be different if not for the Lord? If you never came to know Jesus, how would your life be different? Going back to It's a Wonderful Life, if you've not seen it, it's a 70-year-old movie. I'm going to spoil it for you, okay? If you've not seen it, too bad. Jimmy Stewart's character goes through a whole bunch of trouble. At the end of the movie, he says, I wish I was never born. And here's another fallacy. The angel shows up, Clarence the angel shows up. And he says, okay, here's your wish. You were never born. And he goes back to the beginning and sees what the town is like without him being there. The influence he had on other people. You know, the girl he married is not married and other people are in trouble and all the things, all the good things he did were, were not there. Now, if you've heard this phrase, it came from this movie. When someone, I forget how it goes, angel gets his wings. Every time a bell rings, angel gets his wings, okay? Not biblical. Fun movie, but not biblical, all right? And there's all kinds of things about angels. Babies don't become angels. Angels aren't babies, that kind of thing. So, but anyways, because of his, he gets to see what the world would be like, his time would be like if he weren't there. 
he thinks he has no influence, that his life meant nothing to the people around him. And he gets to see what it would be like if he weren't there. Look at your life. What would, and really look back at your life. How would your life be different if you never came to know Christ? If you never got saved, even if you got saved like yesterday, how would your life, what trajectory was your life on that would have not stopped had you not been saved? How did Jesus change you? What in your life is different? Look back to where you were and compare to where you are now. What is different that would have not been different had you not come to know Christ? And every one of us has a, a testimony of that effect. That I was going on this path, God saved me, and now I'm on this path. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you're now a new creation. The old person's gone, the new person's come. I look at people around me, people I grew up with, people I knew from high school, people I knew from college, and, and some of my family. And I see where probably I would have been had I not come to know Christ. And I, <clears throat> we just, Marion got to go home with me as the Lord. A friend of ours passed away two years ago, just fast. We know about the young guy who just passed away, 18 years old. Imagine if you had no hope. Imagine if that was all there was, that you'd never see them again. As my dad used to say, hey, when you die, you turn to dirt, that's it. Man, that's horrible. The Bible says if you live for this life only, you're the be men most pitied. Because the older you get, they realize your life matters to people that come behind you. And the way that you're different now will affect the people that come behind you. Had I not gotten saved, I have no idea how my kids would have turned out, how my wife would have turned out, how my marriage would have turned out. I have no idea. I have, a, I have an idea how it might have, but I don't know. I just know what is different in me from where it used to be. And every one of us has that in us. When God changes you, you realize what God has done for you. And without that, man, where would you be? Now, some of you guys are just starting out. That's awesome. Young guys, got babies here, babies galore. Praise the Lord. What you do is going to affect your kids. Right? Dobson says more is caught than taught. Your kids will do what you do regardless of what you say. When Jesus changes your life, it now has an effect on those that come up behind you. And hopefully they get to see the difference in you, what God has done in your life to transform you. Last sentence, I promise. As we celebrate Christmas and the birth of Jesus, I want us to take some time and think about where we would be today, given how and where we were before we met Jesus, and be thankful that Jesus was actually born again in your heart. Where are you today? Where were you 10, 20, 30 years ago? Extrapolate on where you were 30 years ago and figure out where you'd be if God didn't come in and detour your life. Would you stand as we close this morning? Would you bow your heads for a moment? Statistics tell us that Christmas and Easter obviously are the biggest holidays that people come to church. But they tell us that Christmas time is when more people who don't know Jesus come to church. Easter is when people who sometimes go to church, go to church. But Christmas is that way because of the spirit that's in the atmosphere. That they realize that church is someplace they should be during the Christmas time.
I believe that's the Holy Spirit prompting the hearts and the minds of the people in the world today. Now, many don't go to church on Christmas. But for those who do, it's, it should be a special time. A time where we're able to focus on not everything that's going on in our life and not even all the presents and the, and the jazz that goes along with Christmas. But we celebrate Christmas because we realize there's something supernatural beyond what we have today, beyond the trees and the gifts. There's something supernatural about this holiday that really touches people's lives. And we want to be careful that we don't miss what God wants to accomplish during this time of the year. The Bible says that no one comes to God unless the Father draws them. In other words, you have to have that thinking in your heart that you want to know about God. And God does that especially at Christmas time. He brings people into his houses of worship so that they're able to hear what God has planned for them. Maybe you're here today and you're, you're a regular attender. You're here all the time. Or maybe you're a person that this is Christmas time, so you're here. And either one is, is perfectly fine. Because God can accomplish in your life what he wants to accomplish, regardless of which end of the spectrum you're on. Because what he wants to accomplish, he wants you to really have a relationship with him. The gift that we have at Christmas is Jesus. God says, here's the gift. And I want you to accept it. I want you to be a part of my family. I want you to understand how much I love and care for you. Here's the gift. But you have to accept it. You have to take it to yourself. You can believe that the gift is there. You can believe in Jesus that Jesus existed. But unless you really appropriate what the gift is into your life, it doesn't mean anything. The Bible says we're all sinners. We're all separated from God because of the sins we commit. But the Bible says the wages of those sins is separation from God. And what that means is eternal punishment. You've chosen to be without God here, God's not going to change that after you die. But the Bible also says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. You don't have to do anything other than believe it and receive it to your heart that God, you paid the penalty for my sins. All the things that I should have paid for, all the bad stuff I did, I should be held accountable for that. But God says, no, Jesus is going to do that for you. And all you have to do is not just believe it in your head, but receive it into your heart and allow God to change you from the inside out. Once you come to that saving faith that you believe in what Jesus says, you'll know a light bulb will go off in your head and you will get it. You will understand what everyone's been talking about. And your life will begin something that's brand new for you. If you're here and you've never accepted this forgiveness that God offers, this free gift that we celebrate Christmas time for, what better day to do it than the day we celebrate the birth of the gift? And if that's you and you want that in your life, you want your life to be transformed right now, beginning now, so your life is on a new trajectory, I want you to raise your hand. That's God calling you today. Maybe you're here this morning and you, you know Jesus, but you're not really in a position that you would be comfortable should he return today. You know Jesus, but you've been kind of lackadaisical at your time with him, whether you haven't read your Bible in a while or haven't prayed in a while, or even haven't been to church in a while, and you know you should get back to it, but there's always something in your life that comes up that takes your attention away from it. Well, today is a day to make that difference. That you can commit yourself to wanting to know more about Jesus. Wanting to understand more of what God's plan is for your life. Not just going through this life on your own, 
but really being directed by the Spirit of God who longs to do that for you. If you're here and you want to really recommit, again, we're beginning a new year in a week, and you want to recommit to this is going to be the year that I really buckle down and, and study a little bit more, read a little bit more, pray a little bit more, and develop my relationship with God. I have it, but I've been kind of not doing it. But I really want to do it this year. If that's you, I want to raise your hand. I want to pray with you as well. Father, we thank you this morning. <clears throat> we thank you that we're able to celebrate this time of the year and have you firmly on the front of our mind. That as we open gifts tomorrow and we appreciate all the blessings you poured upon our life, we realize that it's only because of you. It's only because of what you instituted 2,000 years ago that we we're able to even have this celebration. So, Father, we want to make sure that we do it right and honor the reason that we're even doing it. Let the Holy Spirit prompt us a, a, a gratitude of what you've done for us, not just this year, but every year of our life. The blessings you've poured upon us, even the hardships that we've been through, Father, you've helped us through it. In some places, you've carried us through it. You brought us through some of the worst times in our life. But God, we, we know that you love us and you're holding us in your care through those times. So Father, I pray tomorrow that you fill each one of us here with your spirit. Let us have an attitude of gratitude even as we begin the day. And the celebrations and the presents and the family we get together, it's all because of you. And Father, we just want to thank you for it now in advance. And it's in Jesus' name we do all of it. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. You just made it. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Have a great day tomorrow. Enjoy your family. Enjoy the presence. And enjoy the Lord as well.